place where you're asking God to lead you in faith. And I want to talk about that today. Um, it's, it's, it's part of the journey. Last week we looked at it, and, and it is literally uh, an undeniable, unavoidable facet of life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. This week um, we're starting to talk about vision. Always at the end of the year, we, we position ourselves in expectation for the future. Um, I've been working on it for months and months, um, and um, the calendar's already full, things are mapped out, I can give you an advance warning, next year looks really awesome. Um, but we've got to position ourselves, we've got to position our hearts, we've got to allow God to do His work in order that we'd be in a place for the future. So as, as part of that, um, God is building us, the people of God as a company. Uh, you look in the Bible, there's um, story after story of a company of people who rose up in faith and did mighty things in partnership with God. That's us. That's us. So in preparing for vision, what I do is I, I spend time uh, searching through, uh, revisiting those prophetic words that have been released over this church uh, some of them recently, and, and many of them well before I got here. And I, and I asked God, what is it that he would highlight? It's going to be led by God. It's really important to understand what God has said and also have an ear to listen to what he is saying. And so that's what I've been doing. Vision is vital. The Bible says without vision, you don't know where we die. We're designed by God to need vision, to, to be filled with vision in order to move forward. So yeah, this week and next week, uh, I'm going to speak about vision. I'm going to talk about the pathway. And, 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 and preparing myself in order that I would share things with you over these next few weeks, I've split it into, into two sides. We've got the, the where are we going and what does the future look like side, and then we've got the other side that's how are we going to get there. And so next week, I'm going to talk about the what does the future look like. This week, we're going to talk about how we get there. And the two go together. This is probably going to be one of those messages you'd love to avoid. But uh, we'll make sure that Zach keeps the doors shut so no one runs out. But I really do pray that you would, you know, open your heart to hear what God would say through his word. We're going to look at his scriptures. Uh, the timeless truth that is our guide. That's ultimately what we believe about the Bible. The timeless truth that is our guide. And so it's undeniable, it's unchangeable, it's eternal, unquestionable, and we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at what the author of this good book says, but before we do that, there's another author um, that has often given much wisdom that I'm sure has guided you in different seasons of your life. Now, Dr. Zeus said this, you have brains in your head and feet in your shoes, and you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Well, unfortunately, people live by that, and that's what gets them in trouble. Now, I like Dr. Zeus, so I've spent many hours uh, enjoying Dr. Zeus as a child, but also with my children. But the problem with this quote is that if you use the brain in your head to determine your pathway, often you get misled. And ultimately what we're going to look at today is how do we get led by God? What is God doing and how is God guiding us? Holy Spirit is sometimes a compass and sometimes he's a flashlight. You've got to work that out. But always if we use God and the Holy Spirit as our guide, then we we get to go in the right direction. Here's another note about vision. Direction is more important than speed. Now, I put this one in for people like me who like to rush off and achieve a lifetime of goals before their three o'clock espresso. Um, so, so this is me talking to me here. Direction is more important than speed. And as a church, we're, we're slowing things down a little bit. We're, we're being really cautious, making sure that we've got that right direction in place. Now, I don't know who said this next one, but it's so true. What messes us up most in life is the picture in our head of how it's supposed to be. How many of you reckon that life today is not quite the way you imagined it five years ago? <laughs> or maybe even one year ago? Oh, we get this messed up view in our head, and it misguides us. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Those who you allow to influence your life determine the path you choose. It's undeniable. 
Young people will argue that with me, but now that I'm older, I recognize it to be true. Choose wisely. Powerful things happen when we ask God for directions instead of telling him where we'd like to go. We're talking about direction. We're talking about vision. Today I want to sow something, hopefully, into your heart. There is another quote. It's from me, and I'll give it to you shortly. And it's going to build a a launching pad for the message. But as a church, as a a collective, um, we, we intentionally, purposely create opportunities to invest in people. Just recently, we finished November night school, and we structured that in a way deliberately in order to sow into people's lives in order that they would pursue and begin to identify their personal destiny in partnership with God. It was a fantastic time. A couple of Sunday nights ago, in the middle of the program, we followed God's obedient, um, His instruction, we were obedient, and we, we put aside some time to prophesy into the lives of those who were there, those that would choose to hear what God would say, and for two hours... We were overwhelmed as God poured out his love on people, prophetically declaring promises, hope, restoration, and and exciting things through the prophetic gift. God's heart revealed through prophetic voice. And that doesn't always need to finish there. Jamie, as I was praying for you this morning, I really felt God confirm that this birthday is the beginning of a new season and and that this message today, I'm, I'm excited to say, is part of what's going to shake you for the next season of your life. But pivotal moment, pivotal moment when you get to that 40 window as an adult, you're like, oh, jeepers. But it's like a new door opening and you walk through it and there's some exciting things that are going to be birthed out of that. Let me continue the prophetic declaration over the church as I was preparing this week. This is what God said. This family is pregnant with purpose. This community of faith is poised for a major shift in momentum. This generation is the Joshua generation. We are prepared and positioned to take possession of the promised land. This is the season for the advancement of the kingdom of heaven in this town. The coming season will be like nothing we have seen before. People with purpose. The power of God. Promises fulfilled. Amen. Come on. I'm going to sign up for that. Here's the final quote to launch us into the message today. The magnitude of the promise determines the intensity of the preparation. What does that mean for you? Well, you've got to decide if you're willing to pay the price for the promise. Not everyone does. You've got to make a decision. It's a significant decision if you're willing to go on the journey with God and allow Him to lead you as He has designed. Some fall away, some don't. You've got to position yourself for the promotion God's prepared for you. It's not an easy ride. As I was preparing this, I had this kind of cheeky phrase in my, in my mind. I'm not saying it's God, I'm saying it's me, but you know, you're going to continue to play at elementary level. Or you're going to get in the big game. Some of you are doing a significant work and God says, that was good, move up a level. Some of you have been on the sidelines too long. We've got to move from glory to glory with God. Let's not be complacent and stay in our comfortable place. Time to stand up and step into purpose. The question is, are you willing to pray that prayer, not my will, but yours be done? Some of you, I hope you hear this message. Well, all of you, but there are specific people here that God has been stirring, been stretching and shaking, and this is why, this message. Some of you have been taken out of action, distracted. Maybe the devil's been twisting things. Maybe you've been struggling with depression. Maybe you've been divorced from your purpose. Maybe you're dead on the inside. Today I say no longer. No longer. Let's step into the journey together as a family. 
and allow God to do his work in us. Can I please get an amen to that? It's really easy as we journey forward to confirm in hindsight what we've been doing. For those of you that have been here all year, this is the belonging card. There's plenty of them around if you want to grab one, if you haven't got one. But this has been our theme for 2017, and we have worked through these four areas during the year. And in hindsight, I'm looking at it going, man, God, you're clever to get us to do that in view of what's coming. We started the year and we just reinforce the principle that our identity comes through Christ. And unless we surrender our life to Jesus as the author of our faith, then life has really no purpose. But it's through him that we get to belong as family. We then spent time talking about the importance of a covenant connection, that we're grafted together, bound together, we're family formed and forged in love, the love of our Father. This is a relationship where we choose to commit to each other and honor each other, not because of what each other does, and certainly not because of how we feel in the moment. Covenant connection is far, far greater than that. Someone said to me just the other day, you can't hide in covenant connection. And it's so, so true. We're together through thick and thin. A really important principle in the bottom left corner is everyone must grasp that the freedom Jesus gave us is what empowers us, and without that, it's really hard to move forward. The fullness of our salvation means fully saved, fully healed, and fully delivered, and it's in a revelation of that and an outwalking of that that we can advance, because the truth is you can't be engaged in purpose without being empowered in freedom. You're going to do it in your own strength, and that's just going to wear you out. We've got to search for We've got to find our personal destiny with God and walk it out. We've got to take a life of action that every son or daughter is invited into. Many are called, but few are chosen. And this is why. Because some people choose to stay in one place. But there's no retirement in the Bible. So that means everyone can participate. There's no junior Holy Spirit. So that means... Everyone can participate. There's a father leading us along a pathway into a future that we belong to. Now, I can tell you this, I make this promise, I'm not going to stop calling it out. When I see it, I call it out. When I, when I find it, I want to um, encourage it and empower it and mobilize it in order that people would walk into their fulfillment. That's what I'm called to do. So I'm going to keep doing that. We're the chosen people of God and we're called to demonstrate him through our lives that others would see it. Next year, 2018, this is our theme for the year. Our rhythm defines us. And already I've mapped out, as I said before, I've mapped out a series of um, sessions of what the year looks like, themes and topics and help us to understand it. Because the truth is, when we understand what we're called to do and we partner that with our history and who we are, then we can be effective in what God's called us to do. This is about us all coming into rhythm and alignment, and I'm very, very excited about that. When we're confident in our destiny, we can change the world. We, meaning you. The royal we. The title for today's message, if you like to write notes, is The Pathway to Our Future. There's not one person who's not part of this. I'm really excited that you're here. It's great to see many familiar faces. It's great to see some new faces. This message applies for everybody. As I was preparing myself, I, I often will flick between four or five different books and read what different people say. And there's a book on my shelf that I plucked out just the other day, written by a guy called Dr. Bill Hammond. He's in Florida. He's uh, head of a church group. And he wrote this book called The Day of the Saints. And listen to what he says in the book. At the beginning, he says, The future advancement of the kingdom of God will be achieved by the people of God who are empowered together in unity and purpose. It's not the job of the ministry leaders at church to change the world. It's the people of the church. Let me show you what else Dr. Hammond writes, because this is important for you. The people must receive revelation concerning their calling, privileges, and responsibilities to Christ and his mission. What's the key in that for you? To receive revelation. It means having a spiritual ear open. Church is not a club. This is not a bus stop on the way to heaven. This is a gymnasium where you get to do preparation and training and, and you get prepared to step out and do what it is God's called you to do. 
That's the purpose of church. Dr. Hammond also says this, the local church leaders are a gift to the people to serve, facilitate, empower, and mobilize. That's what I'm called to do, and many others that are around here. This statement comes out of Ephesians chapter 4 when Paul writes about the gifts of Jesus Christ to the church. We're not going to look at that today, but if that intrigues you, go and read Ephesians chapter 4 this week and ask God to show you some new insight. Dr. Hammond continues, he said, when God's word is declared over someone, he puts a creative spirit in motion to help accomplish his will in that situation. See, God doesn't give you a promise and leave you alone and say, well, hope you work it out. God's word is active and alert. It's alive. It's always seeking to see his promises fulfilled in your life. That's what we're going to talk about today. God desires to see the fullness of his promise come to pass, but you must not deny the essential fact that there's a journey to go on, a journey for all of us. Then Dr. Hammond said this, and I was a little challenged by this, no matter how many prophecies you've received, you will never fully reach your destiny without maturity. Bummer. Bummer. You know, like, sorry. You've got to mature before you can get your hands on the promise. It's like grow up before you get the goodies. People look at me sometimes and, and someone advances in purpose and leadership and they go, man, you're so lucky. Or they see what I do and what, I, what I've got or they see my life and they go, wow, you got it easy. See, people look at the promise and they've got no comprehension of the process. There are a few close friends that have walked with me through the dark shadows who have been there behind the curtain when no one else was looking, who have seen the mess the pain, the crying, the destruction as God rebuilds what's essential for the promise in my life. And I can assure you it's still happening. It's still going on because maturity is required to step into the promise. And I haven't graduated yet. Maturity is essential. Before we look at the book of Hebrews and what it says about that, there's one more quote and someone emailed me this this week not knowing why they said hey look god put this on my mind i don't know why it won't go away can can you um can you just process it it was bang on for where i am right here this is what they said powerful spiritual gift is not an indication of maturity fruit of the spirit is for us to step into that you know we've got to harness the gifts and harness the talents god given us but that doesn't guarantee it It's not until we see the fruit flowing in our life that we get to fully appreciate the magnitude of the gifts that God has made available to every single one of us. Spiritual gifts, talents, and calling. So with that in mind, let's get to the scripture because that's that's the more important part. What I want to do today is I want us to take a, I was going to say a leisurely walk. Let's jog through Hebrews chapter 12 because God's got some things to say, so turn the page, swipe the screen, whatever you need to do, get to Hebrews chapter 12. This chapter is all about God's love in action. You might not think that when you read the heading, but it is about love in action. The book of Hebrews, uh, not quite sure, confirmed who wrote it, people more clever than me will have an argument about that, but it's written to the Hebrews, that's the audience, the people of God who have been raised with God's word as their Bread and butter, every day of their life, they fed on it. And his law was deeply ingrained into them. And yet the writer needs to take time to explain to them and to us that Jesus has made the law fully complete, that he's perfect, everything's accomplished. And the writer takes time to connect the history of the people to the future they have in partnership with Jesus Christ. It's a powerful book, unpacking grace versus law and and the love and the purpose of God in our lives every day. But it's not an easy book to read. So we're going to jog through chapter 12. It's, it's an exhortation, encouragement to us that we'd grow in faith. It's a call to maturity for every single one of us. So that makes it perfect for us as we prepare to walk into vision. For us to possess the promise, we must first be discipled. So let's look at chapter 12. We're going to just do this couple of verses and we'll see what God says. 
Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore, the writer says, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses of the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Great! We get to run the race. But if you read the whole verse, you've got to understand we've got to prepare ourselves because the journey in running this race is going to require significant effort. This life in partnership with God is not a sprint. It's not just a, a leisurely lolling walk down to the corner dairy. There's going to be a, a race of endurance, and therefore that requires effort. The, the, um, the original audience would have understood the concept of Roman sport and Roman games, and they would be very familiar with watching athletes strip themselves off of their robes and their shoes, and they'd be nearly naked, but that would enable them to fight or to run or to throw something. So the, the audience is very familiar with this idea of taking those things off that slow you down in order that you could be effective in what you're called to do. It's what the author is talking about. For us to be transformed into the divine purpose of God, there has to be some deconstruction in order for there to be reconstruction. Next week, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about Jacob in the Old Testament because he had a season of deconstruction in order for reconstruction. I'm going to talk about the, the three R's in Jacob's life, the revelation, wrestling, and rebirth. And as we do that, we're going to understand the journey of the vision that God's got for us. So don't miss next week. What does verse 5 say? Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? Do not forget the exhortation that's addressed to you as sons and daughters of God. As I was looking in this, I read many things, and one of the definitions you can see on the screen that I loved about exhortation was it means stirred into power. It's not just a whole punch on the arm or a pat on the back or a, 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 a nice Nice sort of cheesy smile saying, you'll be okay, you'll be okay, it's going to be all right. It's not a shallow word of encouragement. An exhortation is something that stirs you into the power that God makes available for every single believer. That's the kind of exhortation that you have received. It's called the Scriptures. The good news is, God brings it to you as a child. He's close to you. We've got to get this idea that God, whilst he is holy and we must be reverent and awe and have a healthy fear of the Lord, that he's also our father and we can crawl into his lap and be encouraged by him. We're sons and daughters, we're no longer distant, and, and we've got to stop trying to do life with God at the end of our arm. Is it us holding him back? Or I'm not sure. We're close to God. In verses 5 and 6, the writer quotes Proverbs chapter 3. You can see the reference on the screen, verses 11 and 12. The point of the quote here is to encourage us that God is working in our lives as he does all of his children. And we shouldn't be upset by that. It's easy to make the assumption, I suppose, when you read that, is those that are not being disciplined by God are not his children. Truth is, take a look at your friends you probably go, oh man, why don't they get to go through what I'm going through? Well, because God's not disciplining them. Now, that's not your out clause where you jump into the easy street and say, well, I'm going to be like them, because I told you before, choose your friends, you choose your future. But understand, God only disciplines those who he loves, who are inside his, I mean, he loves everybody, but those who have responded to his invitation, he works with. Your life is better with him than it could ever be without him. As I read this, I found another example of um, the concept of discipline, and I want to share it with you because it was intriguing to me, and, and I'm trying to break down, I suppose, negative context that we might think when we hear the word discipline, because some of us, when we were little, discipline wasn't a very good thing. Maybe just the front row. You're all getting flashbacks of a wooden spoon. Anyone? Anyone else? Yeah, come on. You're not being honest. Discipline, 
So let's think, let's think about, um, let's, let's, let's go to this analogy. Let's think about your car that you drove here or the car you're a passenger in, and you've got your front wheels, which I think for everyone is the steering. That's right, eh, Phil? The front of the car mostly almost always does the steering. Well, let's ask Phil. Phil's our, our, one of our automotive experts. What, what's, the, what's the concept of alignment? What happens when your car's not in alignment? What's going on? Your car can veer off the road? Yep, what else? You can wear your tyres out. You could end up in a crash, Jason, that's right. Yeah? So you've got less surface of your rubber tyres on the road, which means it's less safety. Yeah? And so a realignment is bringing them true. Interesting. Yes, Doug? And the engine is working its guts out. Not very efficient, that's right. So think about that and put it in the context of God bringing us into a place of discipline or think realignment. When God's working in your life, he's bringing you into the design that he designed in order that one, you would stay safe and two, you wouldn't wear yourself out. That you would get to the right place in the right way and not burn out. That's actually why he's doing his realignment. Suddenly that might make it a little bit more useful to think of that. What about verse 9? What does the writer say in verse 9? Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, Grace, shouldn't we submit even... <laughs> shouldn't we... Sorry. Sweet dad joke there. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? When we submit to God, we're in the best place we could be. Like, let's look at this Proverbs verse. Proverbs chapter 10, swipe across there, verse 17. People who accept discipline are on the pathway to life. Those who ignore correction will go astray. The Good News translation says anyone refusing correction has lost his chance. So it's choose life or choose death. Which would you rather go? This leads us to the first key point of looking at Hebrews chapter 12. It is this. The pathway to our future will require our submission to our Father's realignment. If we're going to move forward into the vision God's got for us as a church, if if you're going to move forward into the vision God's got for you and your life in partnership with him, if you're going to possess the promises that he's sharing with you, this is going to require submission. Submission to the Father as he realigns. We've got to be open to the work of God in our life. This leads us straight to point number two that I want to talk about, and that is this. The pathway to our future is one that is made possible by grace not performance. The work of God is not work. The fruit is not something that we can conjure up and earn credits for and try really hard and then hope that it pans out. That's not how God works. This is what the grace of God is, the effective work of God in our lives. Grace is the effective work of God in our lives. So what does that mean in Hebrews chapter 12? Let's look at verses 14 and 15. Work at living in peace with everyone, and work at living a holy life, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. We must see that the ambition of God is to bring his, his discipline into our lives in order that we would be made holy, like he is. The New English translation says, pursue peace with everyone. And holiness, for without it, no one will see the Lord. Allowing God to bring His holiness into our lives is what keeps us on the right path. And if we get off the path, we won't find His peace. So you want peace, stay on the path. How do you stay on the path? You allow God to work in you in order to that you would become holy. Verse 15 speaks about how we should live together as a family. And man, we spent all year talking about this. But community, community, living together in a community of faith looks like shared responsibility and accountability. We're not designed to live in isolation. 
It's the number one tactic of the enemy to keep you away from the life of purpose God's got for you, is to tell you lies and get you to hide at home feeling sorry for yourself. It's why we gather together, is to build each other up. It's why we gather together to to share the responsibility and the load. It's why we gather together to be accountable to one another in order that we would stay true to the path God's got for us. People that are not gathering together are at risk of being destroyed. Not everybody, but almost everybody. Security comes when we share the responsibility. Security comes when we are accountable to one another. It's God's design that we'd be in a secure place. Shared responsibility looks like taking care of each other so that no division occurs. It looks like being accountable to one another so we don't get off track or fall behind and miss the mark. You know what I say? Everyone goes into the promise. No one left behind. That'd be a good cry to have, wouldn't it? As a family. What else do we read about the grace of God? Verse 17. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, Esau, Esau was rejected. It was too late for repentance. So there's this section here, you can read more of it in detail, I'm not going to go into it, but there's this comparison the writer makes between Esau, the first son to come out, and Jacob, the second son, they're twins, but there was a reversal that happened in the process. I won't, I won't go into it now, but Jacob and Esau were very different. Jacob ended up carrying the blessing of God. He stole it. We won't do that now. But what you've got to understand is this, is in the scripture, what the writer is implying to us that we should grasp is that Esau represents the flesh. And for our purpose to prevail, the flesh must die. Jacob, the son of promise, represents life in the spirit. And we can't achieve anything significant in flesh, but only in spirit and hand in hand with God. We must submit to God and see his great work achieved through our lives. And speaking to the people of God, he's talking about their ancestors when he says in verse 18, you haven't come to the mountain that's shaking with cloud and fire. He's talking about a physical mountain. It's called Mount Sinai. It's where Moses led the people before God and the cloud and the fire came down and God gave them the law, the 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 conditions for living in partnership with him. This is the location where the people received the tablets. But in verse 22, the author says this to us. No, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. What does this mean for us? And living in partnership with God, we're not living under the law of condemnation and performance. We're living in grace, and grace that's made available because we have this new life of faith. Mount Zion is where we experience not just God's grace that gets us out of trouble, but His glory that propels us into significance. I don't miss the two sides of the coin. Many Christians get their bus ticket to heaven, live under the grace of God, and go, oh, that was good. And they forget that Jesus gave all of His glory to us that we would be his representatives to the world. Don't miss the two sides of the coin. Speaking of Jesus, we find him in verse 24. Jesus is the mediator, it says. You've come to Jesus, the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people in the sprinkled blood, the blood of Jesus, which speaks forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance. We've got to be hand in hand with the grace that Jesus gives us. We've got to be confident that Jesus has achieved everything for us. When we spent numerous weeks, months, talking of the fact that we're empowered in the freedom that Jesus Christ made available for us, I hope you got the point was that it's all done. We remember Jesus, that's why we do communion, but it's all done, it's finished. Jesus said, hey guys, I did it, it's completed, done, sorted. All of your victory is made available in me because I did the hard work. I paid the price for your future. Our life of purpose is founded on the unshakable truth that Jesus has made our victory a completed fact. Read the end of the story. It's a mindset that we've got to have as a church as we move ahead. You know, the worst thing that we could do would be to pray to God and ask him to do things he's already done. 
We must not plead that God would repeat the work of Jesus. What are you trying to do? Send him to the cross again? It's not a telling off. It's a mindset shift. It's a brain transplant where we don't go, please, Jesus, if only you would make my life significant. No, he already said he did. When we start praying in agreement with what Jesus has said and done, we come into alignment with heaven and life bursts out of us. Maybe you've got to change the way you pray. Stop begging and start declaring. You've got all authority. Come on, that's how we change the world, is understanding who we are because of whose we are. Our life of purpose is already made complete because of Jesus Christ. Your purpose, done, sorted. Now step into it. But God's grace is what makes it happen, not your cleverness, not your strength, not the gifts that you carry or the size of the promise, just submission to his work and his grace. So there's two sides of this. That's why I put it up on the screen like this together because point three says this, the pathway to our future is what will determine our reward at the finish line. Ooh. So yes, it's all grace, not performance, but if you don't step up, you won't get the prize. Jesus is pretty clear on that in the, in the Gospels. He wants you to step into the victory that he's made available to you. Take his hand. He wants you to partner with him in the completed work. Don't struggle. Allow him to make it for you. But you've got to know this. How you run the race matters. Matthew 16, Jesus says the Father will judge everyone for their effort. Let that drop like a wrapped sandwich. How we run the race matters. A parable of the ten bridesmaids. Did you read that? Um, the talents. Five talents. Story. Zacchaeus and his encounter with Jesus Christ. What about the, the rich man and the poor man in heaven? Like, just get the message of Jesus. How you run your race actually matters. It actually matters. Let me wrap this up because this is where I really wanted to end. And, and I, like, I was just so uh, messed up before the service and I listened to the kids sing. And some of you have seen the videos online. We've been partnering with a lot of stuff at Heaven this week to shift some stuff that's not from Heaven in this community. And um, this is why I was doing that because we've got to get to the end of Hebrews 12. The writer says, uh, in quoting Haggai, God says, I will once more shape not only the earth, but the heaven too. If you're looking for some references, write them down. It's Haggai near the end of the Old Testament. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Haggai 2 verse 6. I'm going to read through to verse 9. Well, this is what the Lord says. In just a little while, I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the treasures of the nations, and they will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory. And in this place I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. That is a prophetic word for some of you today. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 to 9. Because what you're seeing now, just a shadow. And it's a shadow because good things are coming. Some of you feel like your lives are being tipped upside down. I feel like some of the stuff that I'm going through is just God getting me a shake. You want to know what it feels like? I won't use the words I'm thinking, but it's tough, man. It's really tough. Spiritual battle, spiritual contest, opposition. All of it comes against us and it feels like pressure and we're, sometimes we blame the devil for it. He's nowhere near you. God is doing his work as a father and he's shaping and forming you and he's shaking. Why? Because the things that need to be shaken will come off and what is unshakable will remain. That's what we've got to understand. Let's look at it in the next verse. Verse 27. All of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. God is shaking your life to remove the flesh. And what is unshakable is the spirit, and that is what will remain. 
So we've got to allow God to do his work. We've got to, we've got to go through the pressure cooker. We've got to, we've got to survive the, the shaking and make sure we're not alone when it happens. We've got to stay together. We've got to stay close. We've got to stay tight as a community. And, you know, when someone gets a bit of a shake going on, we don't freak out. We don't judge them. We don't separate them. We don't put them in the weird corner. We gather around them and we pray for them and we love on them and we support them. Shared responsibility and shared accountability. That's family. I can get my team on stage. The shaking of things in your life is God doing his work. The shaking in your life is God doing his work. But the promise in Scripture is that what is unshakable will remain. What God is stripping away is those things that are unnecessary in the land of promise. That's a good word right there. You want to grab hold of that. Team are going to lead us in a minute. Let's do the last verse I wanted to read today, verse 28. The writer says this, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe. Tough question, but will you praise God in the midst of the shaking? Will you worship him from the shadows of turmoil? Will you bow in fear and awe as the author of your life deconstructs a few things? The condition of your heart on the journey is what's most important. We've got to focus our thinking on the things that are of heaven, not of earth. We've got to allow our energy or our emotions to be commanded by our spirit into line. Because when you allow your mind or your emotion to rule your path, your spirit loses out. And that's the flesh at work. We've got to allow it to be shaken off. We've got to make sure we don't place value or measurement or uh, perceived success on things that are earthly, not kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 19 and 21 tells us, you can read it, but it says your heart will be where your dominant focus is. Your heart will be where your dominant focus is. I say all of this as we look at vision and mission and purpose because they're all the same thing. And I say that to say this, the pathway to our future requires us to search for our purpose with eternal perspective and that we would serve it with our lives. Eternal perspective. Your purpose is not your job. It's not your function. It's not your activity. Your purpose has an eternal value. And that's what we've got to find. Bringing the kingdom to where you are. That's your purpose. And to prepare for that, we've just got to allow God to do his work. And Because next week I'm going to talk about vision, but we're not going to get there unless we understand the price that needs to be paid to go on the journey. I've been wondering I've been I've been wondering why I've been so messed up today to watch your family get shaken. It's necessary. I can't rescue you. We've got to allow 
allow God to do his work. And the only way that's going to happen is when we submit to what he's doing. Our future requires our submission. And as we land this morning, praise God, I made it to the end, almost. I've asked the team to come and sing a song. We've done it at night service. Um, you might have heard it on the radio. Kia kaha. Be strong. And allow the work of God to be in your life and that the grace of God would have its way in effective work for your purpose. As Ash sings, as the team play the song for you, you can sing the words if you want. But what I really desire is that this would be your heart's cry. This would be your prayer in this moment that you would say, not my will, but yours be done. Let's pray. Why don't you stand? Father, we come before you as the author of life, purpose, and eternity. We're so grateful that we have a promise of life eternal with you. But God, we've got to submit ourselves now again before you and say, it's not about what we want, it's about what you want. It's about allowing you to shake us. It's about allowing you to reform us in what is in your mind and your heart for each one of us. God, would you give us the strength to stand in the midst of the process and worship you? Would you give us the bold assurance and hope of what is coming and promise, but not yet seen? God, would you shake that which must not remain in order that the unshakable would burst forth in our life? Lord, we choose today to surrender to you. We choose. We choose your, pa- your plan and your pathway. We choose for you to do your work in our lives. Not my will, but your